Okay, Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 35. Says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Uh, I happen to think that this passage, though it's, it's short, is very profound. And uh, I'd like to draw your attention just to the opening words of verse 36. It says there, when he saw the crowds. And uh, it's clear here that Jesus, he looked out, he saw people. And he saw them in a certain way. In fact, there are two images that he uses. One is the, the image of a sheep without a shepherd, uh, helpless and uh, harassed. That's one image. He, he sees them that way. But he also sees the crowds that he sees are harvest. So two metaphors, one a, a little bit more negative, one more positive, so to speak. And uh, my hope today is that uh, we would gain the eyes of Jesus to really look and see the crowds and then... Uh, the solution that's offered here. It's actually a solution of, of prayer. Uh, anyway, let, let's start with this first image. And uh, again, my hope is that everyone, as we think about this passage, will begin to, to see the world the way Jesus sees it. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And... Um, Okay, that's what Jesus saw, perhaps uh, especially here in the United States. Uh, we may think to ourselves, no, uh, that's not how people are. Generally now, life is good, people have it well. Uh, certainly this idea that they're sheep without a shepherd, they're harassed and helpless. Uh, at least here in America, we don't feel that way. And uh, as a result of the fact that we don't see people for who they are, uh, we, may, we may miss something that Jesus is trying to teach us. And... Um, I'm just going to try to make the case that Jesus is right, that uh, people are like sheep without a shepherd, and I, I could probably go on and on and on and on. I'm going to try to do it with just six points, and uh, hopefully everyone after the sermon just keeps on thinking about these kind of things, uh, that people are hurting, that they're in misery, like they're sheep without a shepherd, harassed and helpless. Here are the six points. Uh, first, relationships. And man, I could spend a lot of time, in fact, I could dwell this entire sermon on just the trouble in relationships, the heartache, uh, the pain that people feel, the way we treat each other. Uh, let me do this. Probably the closest relationship that we have in this life is a relationship of marriage. Um, there's trouble there. I, I won't even bother to tell you that the divorce rate in the United States now stands at about 50%. That um, really, I mean, and you could just look at this crowd that means like one out of every two of us are probably going to experience it directly. But if you don't experience it directly, then probably indirectly. Parents divorced or children divorced or someone close to us. Um, our, our closest relationships where we really believe there's supposed to be faith and uh, faithfulness uh, torn apart. And anyone who's gone through a divorce, you know the messiness, you know the hurt, you know the pain. Uh, even if you haven't personally been a part of that, if someone close to you has. But I won't even spend time talking about that. Uh, did you know that of those who are married, so okay, half get divorced, of those who are married, as surveys are done, four out of ten report that they are unhappy in their marriage. In other words, if they could do it all over again, they would prefer not to have married the person they married, four out of ten. Or here, emoticons. Uh, do you realize uh, one out of every four married person, when responding to a survey, says the only reason they remain married is because of the kids? So you say four people who are married, uh, one out of four of them, the only reason they remain married is because of kids. That's what people say in surveys. Um, relationships. They're broken. Many of our closest relationships we're part of. We're, we're miserable then, and there's hurt and there's pain. Uh, all right, 
Next topic. That was only one of six. Finances. So, um, a lot to say here. Let me just simply say this. In, in the United States, do you know that eight out of ten people are in debt? And of the eight out of ten people that are in debt, the average credit card bill is just over $16,000. What does that mean? I, I probably don't have to tell you. I mean, it's 80% of us are constantly in a struggle with finances, feeling behind. Uh, there's anxiety, there's worry, there's concern, uh, sometimes just despondency and despair because I'm never going to crawl out of the situation that I'm in. Um, I mean, many of us who are sitting in this room, uh, listen, it's easy, it's easy to look out and think, oh, we're in America, this is the richest country on earth, everyone's doing, no, uh, that's not the case. Uh, work, okay, so if we're in debt, here's the way to get out of it, uh, work, uh, just only two emoticons this time. Do you know that 50, just over 50% of people hate their job? <laughs> That's not very promising, right? Uh, one out of every two people you meet, if they could, they'd quit. They don't feel any meaning or purpose. It's just toil. It's labor. They hate the boss. They hate the working conditions. If they could, they'd leave. Uh, man, for those of us who work, I mean, that's most of our energy. That's most of our life. And uh, if you look around, one out of every two people wish that they did not have to do that particular job. Here's one. Loneliness. Um, here's the thing. I, I think throughout our life, most of us at one time or another are going to feel some amount of loneliness. Uh, do you realize, though, that one out of every five people reports a chronic or consistent, persistent loneliness. One out of every five people feels just totally, and not just for a short period of time, for long, chronic, severe, ongoing periods of time, totally alone. One out of every five just wishes that someone would, would reach out to them or be their friend, but they feel totally, uh, chronically and persistently alone. Okay, death. Uh, well, bad news, 100% of us will die. <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and not only that, not only that, but 100% of us are going to be affected by death of close loved ones. In fact, there are many people, even in this room right now, who are, they're heartbroken, they're grieving, they're just, there's a dull ache that won't go away because someone very close to them, who's important to them, has died. And, um, well, here, I could probably talk a long time about this, but do you realize, do you know this, that seven out of ten people report that they're totally afraid of death? Just a complete fear of dying, seven out of ten. Uh, point number six, just one more, addiction. Let's just start with the 18 to 25 crowd. Uh, here's what statistics show us. One out of every six people, 18 to 25, is struggling with substance abuse. Uh, one out of every six. So as you look out, you're in Walmart, you're wherever, and you see an 18 to 25-year-old crowd, one out of six. And, uh, okay, that's 18 to 25. Uh, do you think it's any better with senior citizens? You know the statistics are virtually the same? One out of six. So... Um, Here's the thing. Uh, we live in a Facebook age. Um, how's everything look on Facebook? How's everyone doing? It's great. It's amazing. You have fantastic families and a wonderful life. You're always having an adventure. You're usually smiling. Uh, when you meet someone, you say, how are you doing? How, they, how do people respond in our culture? Yeah, I'm fine. Doing great. Uh, and as a result, we don't have the eyes of Jesus. We do not see that people are hurting, that they're lonely, that they're miserable, sheep without a shepherd, helpless and harassed. And as a result, we're just passing people by, not Jesus. Um, he saw that. He saw a sheep without a shepherd, helpless and harassed. And, um, but wait a second, wait a second. Okay, Scott, I'm here in church. The answer is Jesus, and this is a Christian nation, so we're good to go, right? Um, here, I want you to know this, because I think when it comes to the mission of Jesus, uh, it's important to understand, especially if you live here 
in Port St. Lucie or a part of our church. Um, here's what happens, I think, people who become a Christian. Over the course of time, uh, you make Christian friends, you're part of a church. You begin to think to yourself, surely everyone around, all my friends are Christians. There's almost nobody who still needs Jesus. That's not true. Uh, here, let me demonstrate it this way. Uh, I'll call this, this is a phenomenon that's happened in America. Have you heard of this? The rise of the nuns. Uh, here's what it is. When surveys are taken, when the census is done, uh, the question is, you know, are you religiously affiliated? If so, where? And uh, what's happening in America is that the number of people who say, no, I'm not religiously affiliated, I have no religious affiliation, is rising. So, 10 years ago, when surveys were conducted, 16% uh, of Americans said they had no religious affiliation. In other words, are you a Christian, are you a Jew, are you Lutheran, are you Presbyterian, are you Catholic? And people would tell what they were. There would be 16% who would say, no, none, I have no religious affiliation. Uh, Ten years later, today, it's now 23%. Uh, now, just, you know, we're talking about having a transformed, transforming relationship with Jesus that, you know, causes us to be mobilized for his kingdom. There's now 77%, you know, 23 or none, 77% who, who say, you know, when they answer the telephone, they answer service, yes, I'm affiliated with this place or that place. Um, how many of that 77% have a fantastic, transformational, uh, life-changing relationship, vital relationship with Jesus that's changed everything? How many, how many of the 77? You think it's all 77%? Uh, okay, not even close. So, anyway... I don't know what you think of the statistic. Uh, no matter what you're thinking right now, here's what I want you to know. If you live in St. Lucie County, these statistics do not apply to you. It's not even close. Here, um, the rise of the nuns in St. Lucie County. Let me tell you, uh, here, th there's particular data taken at census times. In the year 2000, this was the situation. The population of St. Lucie County is 192,000 and change. The nuns were just over 100,000, which was 52%. So that's what? I guess that's already 17 years ago. Can you believe we're in 2017? Uh, 2000, just feels like yesterday, right? I thought. Anyway, 2010, let me show you this. In the year 2010, the population was 277,000 and change. The nuns were just under 200,000. 71% of people in St. Lucie County now. Uh, those of you who live here, by your experience over the last seven years, has uh, our county become more religiously affili affiliated or less? I, I'm right. I think you're right. In other words, fewer and fewer people. And by the way, I mean, there's plenty of people who answer the telephone. They maybe attend a service on, like, Christmas, and they say, yeah, I belong to this church or that church. Um, the number of people. So you're in Walmart. If you're at your place of work, you're, you're out wherever. Uh, here, here's the thing. I want you to see what Jesus saw. People disconnected from God, hurting, helpless, feeling like there's no hope in the world, uh, often lonely with no relationships whatsoever. It'd be easy for us to think because we watch Facebook, oh, people are fine, right? Or because when we ask people, how are you doing? They say, I'm fine. Um, my hope is that we gain today the, the eyes of Jesus. Um, that's, that's the first image, the first metaphor. Jesus sees the crowd. He sees that they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Uh, there's a second image. It, it's, by the way, much more positive. And uh, I hope that we gain the eyes of Jesus this way as well. Uh, this is what Jesus said. He said it to his disciples. The harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. And um, I'm just going to put this image on the screen. And uh, a few points. First, uh, I want you to see this word. When he saw the crowds, it says, he had compassion on them. And uh, let me make a, a couple of points. First, um, the original Greek word for compassion, it actually meant something like to feel something in your gut. Um, he was like moved in, in the core of his being. Um, we've got this phrase, gut-wrenching, 
Uh, when Jesus saw the situation, he saw people helpless like sheep without a shepherd, he, he was moved to the core of his being. I, I want you to see what it doesn't say here. It doesn't say that Jesus was, you know, frustrated. By the way, he probably had every reason to be frustrated, right? He, he, he's God. Human beings had plunged this world into sin and misery. He could have been angry and frustrated and, you know, just rah! But that wasn't what he was. He was moved. Um, he could have come back like a king saying, why have you betrayed me? Why are you traitors? You know, uh, I demand your allegiance. He didn't, he didn't demand or, or force anyone to do anything. Instead, it was, it was love. It was, there, there was like a gut-wrenching, oh, I can't believe. Now, let me pause here because I think sometimes, and, um, you know, if you're a non-Christian, you're here today, this has probably happened to you. You've met Christians, and unfortunately, um, they, haven't, they haven't met you with compassion. In fact, I know this sometimes happens, that there's a kind of brand of Christianity that uh, I guess is the way I put it, we kind of have around us a cone of holiness, right? Like, no sin can get in, and I am holy, amen, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And, um, and those Christians, how do they treat the, like, I can't believe those sinful, you know. Uh, sometimes I hear, I hear people who are Christians are talking, I want you to see that those Christians don't have the eyes of Jesus. Jesus wasn't that way. He, he was moved, gut-wrenching, love. Second thing, uh, heart of compassion. Um, the word compassion means to suffer with. And I actually believe uh, this phrase, he had compassion on them. It's the heart of the Christian message. You see, at the center of the universe, there's a God who, who doesn't stand far off and say, well, they got themselves in this mess, let them get themselves out, or isn't angry from up above, like, let me torture them as much as I can. He, he's moved with compassion, so much compassion that he wants to suffer with us. And you realize the Christian message, right? That God himself, because of love and mercy, though we're sinners, though he created everything good, though we messed it all up and we're in misery now, he, he was so moved by love that he entered our reality in the person of Jesus Christ. He took on our woes, our troubles. Jesus wasn't born in a palace. He, he wasn't treated with kid gloves, so to speak. He, he lived his life with no place to lay his head. He, he was insulted and harassed, and he came to suffer with us, and this is what's most profound about the Christian message, that ultimately what God came to do is he came to take our suffering himself. In fact, that's what the cross is all about. And here's the heart of the Christian message, that God loved us. So his compassion, gut-wrenching compassion, was so strong. He loved us so much that God took all of our sin, all of our misery, all of its consequences, he took it off of us, he put it on Jesus, and Jesus received the punishment we deserved. He lived the life we should have lived. He died the death we deserved. Compassion. He suffered on our behalf so that we could be back with God and have a brand new life and be transformed and mobilized with a new mission and a new purpose. Anyway, this next image, it's just much more positive. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Um, that phrase, the harvest, let's start with that, because I think this is, it's all also at the, the heart of the Christian message. Um, notice it doesn't say, the field is ready to be plowed and planted, right? Uh, it's not that we need workers to go out who are going to plow the field, remove the stones, plant the seed, water it, give it sunshine, and make it grow. Instead, uh, everything's all done. And by the way, that is the heart of the Christian message. God has himself done everything. In fact, that's what sets Christianity apart from every other religion in the world. Every other religion in the world sees that there's a problem. There's a distance between us and God. God exists. We're distant from him because of our sin. And uh, every other religion, it, it presses upon us what we need to do. So there's a list of rules we need to follow. There's a kind of method or lifestyle we need to carry out. And if we do it well enough, then maybe eventually something will grow and 
No. Uh, Christianity says this, what we cannot do, God has totally done. So we can't make our way back to God. Uh, he came and, and made the chasm between us and him disappear by taking our punishment for us. He's done all the work. Uh, the harvest is plentiful. It's done. And um, if you're a Christian, I, I just want you to, to kind of take this in. God is already at work. He's already done it all. There are people in this world, they're far from God now, they don't realize it, but they're his children. Uh, he has called them, they belong to him, and the harvest is ready. Uh, it's just that they need someone to show them the gospel and, and point the way. But he's already done the work, he died on the cross for them, he sent his Holy Spirit in the world. Uh, do you know that God is speaking to people who are sinners right now, calling them to, to come home? He, he's doing it all. Now, that's the first thing. The harvest is plentiful. Here's the next part, but the workers are few. And um, the word workers, I'd like to just pause on that as well. It doesn't say here, but the leaders are few, or the superheroes are few. We don't need superheroes. We don't need leaders. We just need people who will go out and do this simple work. The field is ready. Just go bring in the harvest. I don't know if you remember this parable. There's a parable that Jesus tells, the parable of the sheep and goats. He says when it's all wrapped up, when everything's done, God's going to call all people to himself, and then he's going to line them up with the sheep on the, on the right side, the goats on the left. To the sheep, he's going to say, come on into my kingdom. To the goats on the left, he's going to say, I frankly never knew you. And uh, of course, the question is, what's the difference? In fact, he says that people are going to ask, hey, you know, how come I'm a sheep? And uh, it's so profound what Jesus says. He says, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was sick, you took care of me. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. When I was naked, you clothed me. And um, I want you to notice what it doesn't say there. It doesn't say, when I was thirsty, you dug a well. No, you just... You did something simple. You gave me a cup of water. When I was hungry, it doesn't say you opened a food bank. Just, you fed me. When I was sick, it doesn't say you built hospitals. It just says you looked after me. You, you came and visited me. You see, the gospel is very simple. It, it's just simple little ways that we demonstrate. And, and this is the thing. Jesus wants to see two things. People are hurting. Do you have the compassion of Jesus? And God's done all the work. The harvest is plentiful. Are you willing to go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus, bringing in the harvest? He's done it all already. Just workers. We don't need superheroes. We don't need people to do something amazing or wonderful. Just the simple acts that demonstrate and speak the message of Jesus Christ, the gospel. That's it. Now, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. That's the problem. That's the problem. There's a solution. And um, I, I'd really like us to think about this solution a lot. The first part, it says, ask the Lord of the harvest. So, it's just very simple. Prayer. Uh, there's a big problem, right? Here we are in St. Louis County. Man, the masses are hurting. They're, they're without a shepherd. Uh, they, they're far from God, but God's at work in their lives. And man, we just need to pray, which is why as we start the year, uh, again, I'm just I, I dare you to pray a simple prayer. God, who would you have me be? Who would you have me become? What would you have me do? Uh, I have to dare you because he could literally turn your entire life around. And, and I just pray that you'll have the boldness. and the, It's God speaking. Whatever he's telling you, do it with all your might. But whatever it is, just, just ask. He's got a plan for you that's far bigger than your plan for yourself. Just ask. And, and what if the people who are gathered here in, the, you know, in Port St. Lucie would pray? Do you real, this city would be turned upside down. Pray. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the harvest field. One more thing, a simple point. 
Uh, do you see this phrase? It, it says this, to send out workers. Actually, it's not a good translation. The original Greek verb means something like this, to thrust out workers. And um, here's the idea. The workers are already there. But they need to be, if you will, thrust out. And um, here, uh, there's no other way to say it than this. I think what we're supposed to pray, it, it's, it's this, that God would light a fire underneath workers who are complacent. So in other words, hey, look around the room. There's a bunch of Christians sitting here. Uh, we're all called by God. We're supposed to have the eyes of Jesus. But uh, man, we don't know what to do. We don't know where we're going. And uh, here's the prayer. God, light a fire underneath people. And uh, I think that's the prayer. The, it's not, we're not praying God raise up the workers. Just ca- God's already, he's, he's got his workers. He's got his workers. But what if a fire got lit underneath people and, uh, and they got thrust out to just see with the eyes of Jesus the hurting, lonely, dejected, cast down people who are disconnected and have no hope, who live in fear each and every day. And what if, what if, because a fire is lit underneath each person, there would be every single person that we come into contact with, a a transformed, a mobilized relationship with Jesus that changes the world? That's what we're looking for. And so as we enter into the new year, um, really, it's really simple. Would we have the eyes of Jesus And would we be daring enough to just ask, God, what would you have me do? And when that fire gets lit, to uh, race at it with a whole heart.